Welcome to the Steve Fox Show, where it's you and the law, where you'll have a chance to talk to two attorneys and get some free legal advice. Tonight, we have the esteemed attorney, David Wallen. David, welcome uh, to the show. Thank you. Good to be we, here. We appreciate you being here. Now, David's been an attorney for over 15 years, and, and while he was an attorney, he originally started as a district attorney. He switched sides from the dark side of the district attorney over to representing the public. <laughs> David, tell us a little bit about your practice. Well, um, we practice uh, specifically criminal law. Uh, that's all we do is criminal defense. We handle all forms of juvenile <laughs> law as well as adult law. We handle uh, people that are being investigated for criminal conduct before a filing. Um, and we attempt to try and get the best disposition for all of our clients. <coughs> now, when they go into the juvenile court, how are they initially charged first? How long does the process take? Tell us a little bit about the process. In juvenile law? Yes. In juvenile court, from the arraignment to the resolution of the case, whatever way it resolves, uh, on the short end, you're talking probably about seven months, uh, and on the long end, about a year and a few months. <coughs> now, get the charges. Uh, do you often end up uh, doing a trial for the juvenile, or is it usually pleaded out? Uh, explain that. Uh, generally, you know, you uh, over 90% of the cases are, are usually done by plea bargain, some kind of negotiation. Um, maybe two out of 100 cases will actually go to trial. Um, you know, but generally you try to get the best disposition for your client before trial. Now with kids, there's no jury, is that correct? Correct. It's just the judge, you, and the district attorney. That's now the, the same judge that uh, listens to the possible plea bargain, is it the same judge that does the trial? Yes, it is. So if you don't accept his plea bargain, what's his reaction when you do the trial in front of him? Well, it's always, that's why I'd rather try and get the best plea bargain I can because you know, judges that have been in juvenile court any length of time, I think they start, um, you know, not believing your client. So I think it's a tougher, tougher road to hoe. I have tried a couple of murder cases. Uh, for juveniles? Uh-huh. And, um, and then one five defendant uh, um, uh, burglary kind of case. And, and so those kind of cases where the offer is so bad anyway, you know, where no matter what yeah. they do. <laughs> you uh, might as well go to, to trial. trial. And we were <laughs> successful on the two murder cases that we, we handled. What was the, the result of the sentence? Well, the last one was a 15-year-old uh, girl that uh, uh, had a baby at home, and the baby was born in the toilet and uh, died, and uh, the, the young uh, girl, child, was uh, charged with murder. Um, I always told the DA's office that this should have been a manslaughter. Uh, they didn't agree with me. We took it to trial, and we were successful to get the manslaughter, and then they asked for prison for the young girl, and I said they were out of their minds because this was a baby having a baby. And I said, what she needs is counseling. And again, the judge agreed with me and gave her no jail time and, and counseling, and, and that's it. What would have been the maximum time for manslaughter, and what would have been the maximum time if she'd gotten the first degree murder? Well, she could have done uh, 11 years uh, you know, for the, um, <laughs> as a maximum time, plus she was 15. So they could have kept her up to the age of 25, really. In YA? In CYA, California CYA. Youth <coughs> Authority. That's a, opposed to saying, sending her to county jail, she'd be in uh, the youth Correct. That's for the youth authority, or the, she could have gone to camp, which is another uh, uh, kind of jail for young people. Uh, but uh, again, the judge down in Silmar agreed with me, um, as uh, I'm glad he did, because I believe it was a fair resolution. Tell us uh, some of the other normal juvenile uh, type uh, crimes that you handle. I would expect or say DUIs, um, theft, or those. Would tell me yeah, what are, what well are some we, of the norms? We handle a lot of those, <coughs> but but because of all the. Um, uh, hysteria, and I don't mean some of it isn't warranted, but uh, because of the things of terrorist threats and Columbine, uh, now we get a lot of terrorist threat types charges uh, where a, a kid will just as a lark say, I'm going to kill you. And all of a sudden he's charged with a felony terrorist threat, he's put in jail. And so uh, we get a lot of those these days. It's kind of like the crime du jour um, for, for juveniles a lot. What, these what's days. the penalty range for a, a terrorist threat? Well, again, you could do anything from no time in jail up to, you know, uh, four years of, of custody time. But as a juvenile, if you're put in custody, let's say he were sent to camp, generally on a charge like that, it would be up to a year. That's the, uh, the, the camp, not the county jail or anything like No, you like wouldn't. That. I mean, as a juvenile, again, unless you're tried as an adult, um, you would normally be sent to a juvenile facility such as camp or California Youth Authority. Do you get time off for good behavior or what's the... 
No, they have. They have generally. They had. They used to have short term and long term camp. Now they have either violent or nonviolent kind of sentences. And if it's a nonviolent sentence, you're talking probably about somewhere between three to six months. And if it's a violent type of offense, like a terrorist threat or an assault, and you're sentenced to CYA or, or camp, you will do as, about a year. So you do a percentage of the time, or do you do the full sentence? No, you'll do the the. the it's it's a, a track, and you you have to finish the track. So you'll do pretty much the whole year or the six months. And while they're in there, they get educated. I, I used to actually teach in the prison camps myself. You're in there, you get your educational experience. Yeah, they have schooling. They have sometimes counseling. Uh, it's probably not the best. I mean, you know, consider the uh, environment. But consider the source. It's just, you know, <coughs> you'd rather go to Paraclete or something like yeah. that or Desert Christian or some other good school than, than something inside camp or CYA. But they do have those facilities. Now, when they first arrest a juvenile, do they still have to read them their Miranda rights or they don't? Um, well, they, they do, but they don't, <laughs> is the answer to that. Yeah, they should read them their Miranda rights, but, but um, most of the time they don't. Um, and, you know, you tell me if you like this scenario. If, if Johnny, uh, if somebody calls and says Johnny's got marijuana on him, well, the principal or the vice principal or somebody from the school then takes him out of class, walks him to a little room where a deputy, now they have the on-campus deputies, is, and they basically just like double team this kid uh, until he tells them whatever, you know, they want him to say. Um, and I've had several kids who've said, I want my mom. And in juvenile law, if, if a, a minor asks for his mom or dad, that's the equivalent of an adult <coughs> asking for a lawyer. But um, in very uh, in a lot of the cases that I've heard, even though the minor does ask for mom or dad, uh, and that should stop the questioning, that usually hasn't stopped the questioning. And so, you know, a lot of the juvenile's rights are trampled on. And so it's always in the juvenile's best interest not to say anything, um, <coughs> even though the police officer is usually going to, you know, harass the kid or, or, you know, basically try to cajole the kid into saying whatever. If, if they do to. that, can uh, by not reading the Miranda rights, do they throw out the statement at all or they can still keep it? Well, that depends on if the police report is, is written that way. In other words, you know, I mean, who knows what happens behind closed doors? I mean, I've had several cases where the minor has said he never read me any rights, but the, the police report will say, I read him the Miranda rights pursuant to Shad for whatever the number is, and, and then they go on, and then it's a credibility call, and, and I haven't seen too many judges who want to be reelected that will support the minor over the police officer. Um, do you also see... Um uh, uh, the DUIs and, and, and that type of thing. Oh, for we juveniles. do a lot. We do a lot of DUIs for yeah. juveniles and adults. Now, now again, the DUI, in addition to the criminal charge, they'll also have a DMV hearing with that. Correct. So both uh, both of them have the ability to suspend the license. What's normally the range and penalty for a minor getting a DUI, and what happens on the DMV side? Well, in the DMV, if a minor uh, has any measurable amount of alcohol on his breath, and they will take his license if he doesn't fight it and win uh, for a year. Um, and uh, in, in juvenile court, um, you can get anywhere from no time up to six months in jail for a first offense DUI. But normally, uh, my experience has been when I was practicing here in, in the Antelope Valley Juvenile Court, is that generally the judge likes to put uh, the young people in jail for three to five days um, to teach them a lesson, and, and that's what happens here. In adult court, if you're an adult and you get a DUI, the standard sentence in the Antelope Valley is three days in jail. You know, I've gone to Beverly Hills and other jurisdictions doing the DUIs, and all of a sudden, uh, there's no sentence. Well, I used to be a DA in Beverly Hills, and when I was a DA in Beverly Hills, the sentence was a $390 <coughs> fine, <Right. coughs> penalty assessment, three years probation, and afterwards, some <laughs> clerks would go out and have a drink with you. I mean, it was fairly uh, lenient compared to the Antelope Valley, where it's been three days in jail for a first offense. I know uh, second for a offense is 10, 10 full days here. Um, and, and fines. I, I, there seem to be very st a lot more stricter up here. And, and, you know, we all understand. I mean, we all have the nightmare of our family driving in the van and some drunk driver going over the double yellows, but it is a lot stricter here than in, I think, any other uh, court in L.A. County. Is that right or wrong, or <coughs> is well, it different uh, for depending on the judge? Or? It's, it's right if you're sitting at home and the person that's uh, arrested for it isn't your, your brother, your father, your sister, your aunt. It's wrong if it's you and you may lose your, your whole job uh, and your livelihood and therefore can't pay your mortgage because now you're going to lose your license for at least uh, a one month minimum, possibly four months, and you're going to go to jail. So it depends on uh, if your ox is being gored or and not. And then afterwards you ask for that you can appeal for a restricted driver's license to go to and from? Uh, well, with the DMV, uh, if you lose the DMV hearing, um, <laughs> the best you're going to get is 30 days uh, totally gone, and then for the next five months you can get a restricted to and from work 
in the course of uh, and scope of your employment to and from a drinking driving program. That would be for the next five months. That's the best scenario if you uh, lose the DMV hearing. What's the percentage of win lose? And now these DMV hearings, I do a lot of phone DMV hearings. Right. You can also go down to San Bernardino. Any different results if you go down to the hearing? If you do the phone hearings? Um, well, the only way you're really ever going to know that is if you get to do the same DMV hearing twice. Um, so I don't know. I, I, I will say that um, I don't really, in my own practice, feel there's much of a difference. Um, so I, I do them telephonically, and we win our fair share of, te of a telephonic DMV. What are some of the grounds you win the DMV hearings on? I've done about 13 of them, and, and actually the last one I, I, I won, but it was only because my client was a cop, and it was a cop giving him the ticket. And I kind of think I had a credibility uh, to be able to win on that one. But they seem very hard to win. Well, they're not easy uh, to win, but we've won yeah. several on, on uh, sometimes the officers won't sign their name in the proper place. Uh, sometimes the probable cause is, is lacking, and we're able to win in that uh, scenario. Um, so there are a lot of different possible ways to win. Sometimes the blood, is, if it's a blood uh, kind of a DUI, isn't drawn within three hours of the uh, stop, and therefore uh, you can't use it, and therefore you can't be found to be over an 08 in, in the DMV hearing. So there's a number of different possible ways. I had a 1-9, a gentleman that came in with a 1-9 blood alcohol, and he'd gone to three or four other general practitioners, and they said they couldn't help him. And I said, well, I don't know if I can help you, but I'll, I'll, I'll try and, and find some problems. And we found some issues with the case, and we did win in that what case. What were some of the issues you found? Uh, in that <laughs> case, there was a probable cause problem with the stop. Uh, and so we did a 1538.5 motion, a uh, motion to suppress evidence based on an illegal yeah, stop. At a DMV no hearing, you could do your 15? Yeah, it's not, I mean, you, you, it's not called that, but it's sure. basically the, you, the, the three issues at a DMV hearing are, was he stopped legally, was the person arrested legally, and did the p person have an 08 or greater at the time of the uh, driving? So if you win any one of those issues, you win the DMV hearing. Um, and so, you know, we were able to be successful in that case. But every case is different. So you could have a 1-2 and not find a problem, or you could have a 2-4 and find lots of problems. So it's not the number uh, that really makes or breaks a DUI. What case. are some of the things you look for to show there was no probable cause? Well, um, there's a, a thing here that a lot of people in the criminal law parlance know. And that is that a lot of times officers will simply park outside of the local watering holes, such as the schooners or the cattle company or whatever, and then they'll just wait for guys walking from the, the local establishments to their car, and they'll let them drive about four or five blocks and then pull them over, and they'll say, well, on routine patrol, I was driving and I saw them. And so a lot of those times, if we're able to find that the officer's not being totally candid, uh, with the reason why he stopped him, then we're uh, able to, to win in that kind of a situation. We just got a case where one of the reasons for the stop was uh, they said the ball hitch was blocking a part of the license plate. Well, we took a look at the ball hitch and it wasn't at all. So we're, we're I think we just filed the motion on that uh, today. So, you know, there's a lot of ways to, to try to show that, that the probable cause wasn't legal. Sometimes they say the probable cause is simply a cracked windshield, or uh, sometimes it's the uh, the film on the windows to make the the tint the tinting on the windows, um, and you know a lot of times it comes down to credibility. And now, now I've noticed sometimes when someone doesn't take their you know their test for alcohol or DUI test, there's a larger suspension for that. What's your experience on that? Well, again, if you lose the DMV hearing or you don't file an appeal. <laughs> Then on a first offense DUI, the difference is on a first offense DUI that you take a test, you're, if you lose a DMV appeal or you don't do an appeal, you're going to lose your license or your driving privilege for 90 days uh, or uh, totally lose it for 30 days and then restrict it for five months. But if you don't take the test, then it's one year on a first offense. It, uh, there's <coughs> I had one where the, uh, the person actually cussed out the cop, and I saw even a longer suspension of the license when they refused to take... Uh, the DUI test. But again, that was a number of years ago. <coughs> so you're saying it's set for the one year, uh, no matter what. And then if it's the second DUI, isn't there a two-year suspension? It's a two-year suspension, but you can get it restricted after you complete one year of the 18-month uh, drinking driving so you program. You have to finish the whole program just a no, year. After a year, you can get a restricted license. Okay, with that, we'll take a break. And again, you're on with uh, Attorney David Wallen, who has one of the, it has the largest uh, criminal law practice in the Antelope Valley, I believe. And uh, again, we appreciate you. And and make sure after the break uh, you can call in at 726-0382 and have an opportunity to talk to two attorneys. Welcome back to the Steve Fox Show where it's you and the law, where you have an opportunity to listen to two attorneys. Tonight's show deals with criminal law. 
and we're lucky to have attorney David Wallen, whose only practice is criminal law. He has the largest criminal law practice in the area. If you'd like to talk to him in the second half of the show, call him at 726-0382. Now, David, we were just talking about juveniles, but the, you've also handled adults, in fact, quite a few, if I understand. Sure. And to give us some of the stories, without mentioning names, of some of your felonies, interesting ones, or misdemeanors you've handled. Well, we, um, we're, we're right now in the middle of a case uh, where the, um, the gentleman is part of a five defendant uh, a robbery, kidnap type situation where the witness for the prosecution is someone who herself just got arrested for robbing a subway and is looking at 12 years in prison on that. And our client was also charged with murder uh, based really only on her testimony. And the DA's office just had the uh, good uh, insight to dismiss the murder charge against our client. But they're still proceeding on the, um, the rape, robbery, kidnap, where she's still really the only witness uh, to any great extent against my client and, and some of the others in this five defendant case. Um, and um, it's going to be interesting because uh, um, if law enforcement you know, doesn't like someone, they think they're a bad person, mm -hmm. they will try and just totally oh. just throw mud all over them. Well, this, on this occasion, they've got this lady who is one of the muddiest ladies you're going to find in terms of credibility. She was a snitch. She was a drug addict. This and is a the drug witness sales. you're talking about. This is the witness for the prosecution. And that's their star witness. And their, their only explanation was, well, even though she's just kind of a, a robber and all this other thing, she still can be a witness. And so it's just funny the way that, that, uh, you know, the law works. You just have to um, grin and bear it and you... Now, a number forward. of times I've noticed people have bail set for them. What's How do they make the standard of bail? What, you know, give us some examples of some of the crimes, the amount of bails. Well, there's uh, what's called the recommended bail mm -hmm. schedule uh, in court and all the judges have that. And, and for certain crimes, they, they have uh, an accompanying bail schedule. I, I offhand don't know uh, the, the exact numbers, but generally like, you know, for let's say a a car theft, it's 20000 and for a possession of methamphetamine, it's 10000 and things of that nature. And with that, I'll point out we have a call in. Attorney Steve Fox and Attorney David Wallen, can we help you? Yeah, what if you have a, a stolen car uh, theft and he's having butt sex in it? What do you do then? What did you say? I couldn't understand you. Uh, if you have a stolen car theft and, and he's having butt sex in the car. Oh, God. Well, uh, I appreciate that conversation. I think that's also a sex crime, but I'm not sure. Oh. I think we've lost that one. Sorry. <laughs> oh, um, Welcome to the end. Again, uh, talking, <laughs> talking more about bail. Have you ever gone in for a bail reduction hearing? Mm -hmm. Sure, we've we've handled whenever we get retained um, on somebody who's in custody. Uh, we always at the first at the arraignment. We also do an OR. Um, and OR mark, stands for own recognizance. <coughs> we ask the judge to release this person on their own recognizance for a bail motion. Um, the judge has to believe the charges are true. So that's the hard part because a lot of our clients, or some of them at least, will say they didn't do this thing or that thing. Um, but for a bail, for the purpose of bail, the judge has to believe that the charges are true. And then assuming the charges are true, the two and only issues that are important for bail are, is the person a flight risk? Or two, is the person a threat? And so we try to put forth evidence to the judge that shows that our client is neither. Now, I had one where the lady stole a, a washing machine and they actually hit it with a hundred thousand dollar bail well, I went in there and got the bail reduction but they only reduced it to fifty thousand and actually what difference did it make she couldn't afford the fifty thousand any more than the hundred thousand yeah did she get off clean um, actually was, the really sad <laughs> part is is um, when I walked in there and and I tried you know, a felony is uh, you know four hundred dollars or more er, and I walked in there and said uh, here's some ads on what uh, dishwashers and are worth uh, and I thought I was going to win on the argument that it shouldn't have been a felony they asked if I wanted to see the evidence. I said, what evidence? They said, the U-Haul out back. So it turned out she allegedly had taken so much more that the uh, actually offer went up, unfortunately, as to what they uh, were offering. Well, th there's sometimes there's no rhyme or reason. I mean, I've had cases that I thought the judge would not rule in our favor and did. And I've had cases that I thought the judge would, would rule in our favor and didn't. So um, it really depends. It, you know, criminal law is not like math. It's not like one plus one is two. If the judge, <laughs> you know, feels that day that he doesn't feel comfortable with that client, that client's not getting out. Where you could take that same client to another judge, and another judge might say, yes, let, let him out in their, his or her I, own recognizance. I had an interesting one where my client had uh, allegedly a conviction of a felony previously. Uh, they were arrested, and I requested um, bail on them. And, uh, I guess the policy up here is if you have uh, felony probation, you don't get bail. But Unless they, you're an actor <coughs> in Ally McBeal. And, and they let, her, let my client out for a week. We came back. 
when they when they realized she had bail, all of a sudden they rearrested her and announced the rule. Criminal law is an interesting thing. I love criminal law. I've been doing this for 15 years. I wouldn't do anything else. We, we appear to have a call. Uh, attorney Steve Fox and Attorney David Wallen. Yes, Mr. Wallen, if you were in the district attorney's office and you had to prosecute that case with the uh, star witness being a little bit muddy, how would you proceed? Well, if I felt that the evidence and the only evidence or strong evidence um, uh, against the defendant was a witness who I felt was not credible, then the standard and I think the policy still is that if you don't feel in your own heart that you should prosecute, you should dismiss the case. So do you agree with the murder charge being dropped? Of course I do. I think it should have been dropped a uh, long time before it was, but thank God it was finally dropped. Okay, thank you very much. And, and again, that's the interesting thing about getting things dropped. How often have you gotten things dropped on a technicality? And can you give us some examples where you were able to get the charges dropped or did the police do something wrong or get the confession thrown out? Well, I think that a lot of times uh, we'll get charges dropped if we get them dropped. Um, either because legally uh, we, tr we prove to the uh, district attorney's office that they can't make the charge or in the alternative um, that for some emotional reasons uh, that this client deserves to get it dropped, even if they were guilty of that crime. So, you know, if we, if we have a district attorney who is a fair, reasonable district attorney, which uh, we've run into quite a lot, um, then uh, you give them, if you have the right client with the right um, uh, posture, then you can get a charge dropped even if they're guilty. I've had some interesting cases, and maybe you can give some examples. I had one where I asked for a monitor uh, for a DUI where they put the monitor on the uh, person's foot. And uh, the person I had was old. I was a second DUI, and I convinced the court, uh, since he has medical problems, to let him at home. Unfortunately, he did succeed in the 10 days uh, with the monitor. Unfortunately, he died the next day. My next problem was I didn't have a client anymore. But um, uh, being that as it may, I've gone to other judges in the same jurisdiction. They say, well, the code says jail, and they won't give me the, uh, the monitor on the foot. Well, and that, says that, that makes my point. You can have the same case before three different judges and get three different <laughs> dispositions. Uh, that's why criminal law, it's, you know, I've had clients who goes, uh, who will tell me, but Joe uh, did a, this kind of a crime and, and got, you know, two years. Why is Uncle Fester getting six? There's no, there's no way to make this like math. Uh, every case is unique and different. That's why I love criminal defense and criminal law. That's why, uh, you know, God bless you for doing personal injury and bankruptcy law. I never want to do that area, those areas of law. I love criminal defense because every case is different. I can do 500 DUIs, but every one has a different thing to it that makes it interesting for us. What are some of your more interesting cases you've done over the years? Jeez, um, I'm trying to think. Um, I've done probably, uh, both as a district attorney and as a defense attorney, probably about a, over 100,000 cases. So trying to come up with one right now is, uh, is, um, is a little mind-boggling, <laughs> to be honest with you. <laughs> um, maybe you can tell me some of yours, but I, uh, um, uh, you know. Well, what, what I actually specialize in when I do the criminal is I'm more of a negotiator. And uh, normally when you have a felony, there's a two process. You do the prelim. And if the prelim finds there's, uh, I guess, almost a shred more evidence that the person will be convicted, it gets bumped up to the trial phase. And I try to negotiate between the, uh, during the prelim. And, and my whole thing is, can I make something work where uh, the DA is happy they got their pound of flesh and my client's happy? I had one where <coughs> the lady couldn't go to jail because if she did, uh, her husband would go in there in the family law court and take away the kids. So I actually negotiated a lot of Caltrans picking trash up in return for no jail time. So my goal is always, can I make something work? Well, the, st the stats are, at least the la they were last time I checked, that out of every 100 cases, 96 of them are going to be resolved by plea negotiations or plea bargaining. About two cases out of the 100 will go to trial, and about two cases out of the 100 will be dismissed. So those are the statistics, uh, no matter what kind of a charge you're charged with. Tell us about much. the three strike. What exactly is it? What does it mean? And what's your opinion on how it's going to be enforced? Well, um, three strikes law basically is if you're charged with one of what's called the serious violent felonies enumerated in the code, like rape, robbery, murder, um, and uh, several other types of crimes like that, uh, those are now considered strikes, as well as if you pick something up like that as a juvenile uh, at the age of 16 or 17. Um, and so uh, once you get a strike, if you get another felony or another crime that can be uh, charged as a felony, uh, 
after you've got a strike, then instead of, let's say, the, the normal exposure on that case would be three years, because of the prior strike, you're looking at six years at 80 or 85%. So it, it enhances the penalty. It enhances <laughs> the penalty for a second strike. And the third strike is what most people know about, and that is if you're looking at a third strike offense, it's 25 years to life. And the, lo the law still is that no matter what the third strike is, uh, whether or not it's a serious violent felony or not, even if it's possession of a gram of cocaine and you have two prior strikes, you still can be looking at 25 to life. Although the, the new uh, DA, who used to be my boss for approximately three years, Steve Cooley, said that he is not going to be pursuing those kind of charges uh, that are not serious violent felonies as the three strike case. <coughs> Do you think it's within the DA's purview to decide which ones are going to make a three strike and which ones are not? Well, that's the, the, the adversarial system. They're the ones who decide uh, uh, how they're going to pursue the criminal um, you know, now course of conduct. Now, how old can a strike be? Does it, it, can it be forever? Yeah, or there's no burnout. What about um, if you want enhancement, you've done two DUIs, how old do the DUIs have to be? Isn't there a length of time? After well, but, seven okay, years well now, now, but that's not three strikes. That's right. a whole separate issue. And in terms of DUIs, if you uh, get found guilty or you're pleading guilty of a DUI, you, it's priorable is what it's called for seven years. So if you pick up another DUI within seven years, then that first now uh, will make this next one a second. You're looking at enhanced penalties. And then again, if you pick up a DUI within seven years of two other prior DUIs, now you're looking at a third with a minimum of 120 days in jail. <coughs> and then the fourth DUI within seven years, you're looking at a felony. Now, do they start that seven years when, uh, from the date of conviction or from the date you're charged with another case? No, it's offense to offense. By offense? You mean for conviction? In other words, from the date, no, from the date that you pick up the charge. Oh, the and charge. the reason, they, they used to have it the other way, but they <coughs> realized too many defense attorneys were just stretching cases along. The to, moving to target. Moving, moving, moving the case along to try and get it out of so the seven-year period. It, the seven-year period falls when he committed the offense. Correct, correct. So if he committed it and then is convicted, uh, you know, exactly seven years ago, it doesn't count because it was committed longer than the seven years. Correct, it's when you were uh, committed the offense, <coughs> not when you were convicted of it. Now, have you <coughs> now getting an evidence into a criminal case? I noticed uh, the discovery when you walk in; they give you the police report and other statements. Is the police report automatically always entered in, or do you get that out of evidence? Or well, that's not ev that's not evidence. That's simply discovery. Okay. Uh, the only thing that's evidence is that which is admitted into a court proceeding, and that would only be testimony or documents that are legally admitted into evidence. Uh, I've rarely seen a police report admitted into evidence. So when you're doing a, a prelim. Uh, an original prelim, they don't uh, let the uh, police report in? Well, it's not that they let the police report in. What they do is uh, a police officer that has over five years of training uh, or had post-training can testify about hearsay that is in the police report, but it's still you got to have someone testify about that. Do we have another call on one? Attorney Steve Fox and Attorney David Wallen. Can we help you? I think it's line two. Uh, yes, Attorney Steve Fox and Attorney David Wallen, uh, we're here. Can we give you some help? Yes, I'd like to ask um, uh, Mr. Wallen, why is it that juveniles have no rights when they go into court? Well, um, they're, uh, allegedly, if you talk to people uh, in law enforcement, and, and um, they will tell you they have lots of rights. Um, but um, several years ago, they, they took away the right of juveniles to even have a jury trial. Um, so they took that one away. And um, uh, I, I, I agree with you. I think that juveniles have less rights in practice uh, than it says on paper. Um, I mean, you tell me, do you think it's right that if a juvenile uh, is on campus and they're uh, suspected of something, that the principal, who's supposed to be acting as like the parent, a guardian to protect the child, basically sends him to slaughter and tries and then helps basically the police officers get a statement from this minor. Uh, do you think that's right? No, I don't. Of course not. And, and the thing that I, uh, I I feel bad about, because, you know, I'm 46. I was raised, you know, back in the Leave it to Beaver ages. Um, and, you know, I was raised to respect law enforcement. And the thing that makes, makes it really sad is law enforcement is now offending normal law-abiding citizens by the way they treat uh, some of the, the law-abiding citizens like children, you know, brothers, sisters. And I think it's terrible for public relations. Uh, I just wish they would they would find another way to deal with it. But but I'm in agreement with you. I, I, I don't think it's proper that, that schools act that way, but that's the law. And if they don't act that way, they could they could potentially be, uh, you know, found guilty of some crime. The but children are not protected under the Constitution? As well, they're, they're supposed to be, but but again, I can only tell you from my experience. Uh, I've, I handle hundreds of juvenile cases, um, and 
um, these juveniles don't know each other, but they all, they pretty much all tell me the same thing. And that is that, you know, the school official takes them into a little room with a, with a big deputy with, you know, guns and badges and they ask for their parents and the, the police officer, you know, says, if you don't tell me what I want to hear, you're never going to see your parents again. And so they have these kids basically peeing in their pants. And so they'll say anything. And so um, do they have rights? They should. And according to the Constitution, they do. But some people might believe that the Constitution stops at Stan Canyon right. and doesn't yeah. exist in the Antelope Valley. That's why I do not handle cases uh, in terms of when I go to court. I won't go to court here in the Antelope Valley. I don't believe you'll get uh, as objective a reading of a case as you will down in Silmar, where I take all my juvenile cases. Can you request that a juvenile be taken to a court outside the Antelope Valley? You sure can. I do that every single time. You're welcome. But again, <coughs> what you mean by that every single time you have to uh, disqualify the judge in order to be taking it, take, or the judge has to disqualify. Am I the judge either has to recuse himself or you have to file what's called the 170.1 motion. I'm sorry, 170, I think it's a 170.1 motion in terms of saying this judge would be prejudiced. Uh, it just so happens that, that with regards to the, the juvenile court up here, there's only one judge and he and I don't see eye to eye on some issues. And so he knows once he sees my face in court that I'm going down to Silmar. And with that, we'll take a break. And again, uh, you can call in after the break at 726-0382. Thanks. <music> Welcome back to the Steve Fox Show. And tonight, you have an opportunity to talk to two lawyers. We're very lucky tonight to have attorney David Wallen, whose only practice is criminal law, and he has the largest criminal law practice up here. And we have another call here. Attorney Steve Fox and Attorney David Wallen, can we help you? Yes, I have a question. It's not necessarily regarding um, to what you're speaking about today. Um, I was wondering, um, I have a 10-year-old son that goes to an elementary school here locally, and recently um, his teacher has been um, pretty um, kind of like shouting and yelling in the classroom. And I was wondering if there's anything that can be done about that. You know, the principal has been present at certain times when the teacher has yelled. Well, well uh, normally I'd give it to you, but I was unfortunately a school teacher for 10 years. So let me at least attack that one a little bit. Okay. Um, you have a lot of options. You can request the child be put in a different classroom. Uh, you can make an appeal to the principal, to the school board. Um, usually what I found is if you come up with a solution, you have a better chance of getting some results. <coughs> you can, um, and again, if you feel something's <coughs> abusive, uh, legally uh, e even teachers have to report any form of, of child abuse. But I, I, again, I don't know uh, to what extent the yelling went. And obviously, it can disturb the, the child and the educational process of the child. Um, and actually, okay, the teacher has not yelled directly to my, to my child. But she's yelled to certain students over and over again to the point where the child, you know, his friends of his, have cried. And well, again, you, I would start out with your parent conference, and I would start out going up the ladder to the principal okay. and go up the ladder to the, the actually, we have a number of um, school districts in this area. We don't just have one. Uh, there's several junior high districts, there's one high school district. You can actually have an opportunity to speak to the board of trustees of whichever school district uh, you're in. Okay. Uh, any member of the public can do that. Okay. Okay? Great. Well, thank you. You're welcome. Um, normally I'd give it to you, but I, I taught for 10 years, so. I'm glad you didn't give it to me. That's and actually, I also taught in the prisons. After you were through with them and you did your best, I got to teach them uh, in the jails. I was taught in Munts, Bendon Hall, Mariloma, and a number of them. Uh, in fact, I saw a lot of my regular graduates from the regular junior highs when I taught in the summer, I got to see them graduate into the prisons. It's go. a sad but unfortunate reality. Mm -hmm. In fact, I saw one one day, and I, one of my best students says, what are you doing here? He said, I was part of a drive-by. So you never know who's going to end up there and, and what the system's going to do to them. Uh, an interesting thing, too, while well, we're talking about schools and crime, um, and I worked for LA Unified, and a kid was bad. He got after-school detention, paper pickup. But up here, as you mentioned, they're using the sheriffs to institute discipline in our schools. I've had cases where a kid threw a piece of candy and got a misdemeanor ticket I had to represent. I've had kids where they had a fight in the locker room and all of a sudden another misdemeanor ticket and he's, he's in, in the juvenile court. I had, I had a young man who had a fight <coughs> on campus, no doubt about it, he, he should have been charged with assault. But because instead of just like hitting the child, he put him in a hammer lock that I guess he, he told me and it was in the police report that he watched wrestling, so that's how he knows how to fight. He was charged by the officer with attempted murder because he put him in the hammer lock and he said that the guy might have lost his breath for a second or two. So that's what the officer actually tried to get the DA's office to file. 
Um, it just shows you that some, in some cases, in too many to mention, uh, the system um, needs to examine itself. But it's very difficult because, you know, it, it's not a politically correct thing to say that maybe law enforcement isn't doing everything correctly because, <laughs> you know, judges aren't going to say that because they want to be reelected and they wanted to say on their posters supported by Los Angeles sure. Sheriff's <laughs> Department, supported by the district attorney's office. And so it's politically incorrect to, to say maybe we're doing something a little wrong and we could make it better. You say that, you sound like you're a communist especially in the Antelope Valley. So, you know, so the bottom line is that, that uh, you know, I believe that th to say we need <clears throat> to fix something um, doesn't mean that you're not American. Well, you know, I'll go one step further that bothers me. It's almost like double jeopardy. Not only get, does the child get charged with the misdemeanor ticket, but once that's done, all of a sudden the school district makes a charge, and I've gone to the high school for a couple of hearings, and they try to expel them from the school district. So he gets he gets charged at both ends. Well, sure. And in fact, there is some law that uh, I saw in the papers a few days ago that if you're convicted of a felony, some school districts aren't allowing the student back into school. So there's no tolerance policy. Right. So so it becomes so serious. That's why in my practice I have three lawyers that work with me, but I'm the attorney that handles you know 99% of the juvenile law because I consider it uh, such of a serious situation, especially so young. Um, that's why we work so hard to try and, and get our, our minors away from felony convictions so they don't have to be kicked out of school and so it's not on their record forever. <coughs> Let's talk about that. Once something's on their record, um, when they turn 18, you can seal their records? Have you done much of that? Um, you can, but the, mo the, the main people that I hear, lawyers, you know, uh, telling that to clients, that's really just a, an easy way to sell the, the plea to the client. Uh, because really sealing a record doesn't do what people think it does because if a minor seals a record um, federal agencies are still going to be able to get to it governmental agencies are still going to be able to get to it any law uh, enforcement <coughs> agency is still going to be able to get to it any place that needs to be bonded licensed or insured is still going to be able to get to it so unless you want to work at like walmart the rest of your life sealing your record doesn't do squat it may make people get warm fuzzies but that really doesn't help. So you've got to really get the job done before you plead out. Because then, if you, even if you seal the record or not, at least they'll see that maybe you got it reduced to a misdemeanor and you weren't a convicted felon as a minor. Now, what about expungement, to, which is to wipe out the record uh, after you've finished the probation, to have you re take back your plea and you're found innocent? How does an expungement, uh, what can be expunged and how does that affect the person? Well, again, expungements are really done for adults most of the time. And so, um, that's again that's another way that attorneys that that want to sell the case to their client makes it easier for them to take the deal because a 1203.4 motion which is what you're talking about expungement all that does is I mean if there's no this is the years of the computer so there's no like legal whiteout so all it does is on you know if you were to get your rap sheet on day one it was said arrested for crime X on day two let's say you get the expungement done it would say plea withdrawn enter a plea of not guilty and then um, dismissed in the interest of justice that's what it says so the whoever wants to see your record is going to see you were convicted of this crime and if you were convicted of a felony and you do this 1203.4 motion that still means that you still can never possess or have uh, or either possess or own a gun because you still would be considered if you were convicted of a felony and you do that motion to expunge some people think or maybe they, the, these lawyers that that you know don't specialize in this will tell their client yeah go ahead now you're no longer a convicted felon well that is so much manure so you're still you excluded are. from carrying a gun even Correct. if the, it's been expunged if you get it expunged and and you are then caught with a gun you're going to be charged with felon in possession of a gun so I'm just saying it doesn't do what it, it, it what people think it does. If you want to really have your record expunged or, or where you no longer are a, fel are a felon, you have to wait 10 years from the date of conviction and do what's called a certificate of rehabilitation, which is like a governor's pardon. That's the only way to get that done. And you go to the same court for that? No, you end up going to Superior Court, and the one we did was downtown L.A. Okay, we have another call. Attorney Steve Fox and Attorney David Wallen, can we help you? Hi, Steve Fox. This is Christina. Um... My little brother got a DUI, and he doesn't even have a driver's license. He just had a permit. I would like to know what his rights are. How old is this person? He is um, 16 and a half. I have a few brothers and sisters, but the one that was in trouble, he's 16 and a half. Well, the when, when someone's license is suspended, it's not their license, really, that's suspended. It's really their privilege to drive. So whether or not you have a permit or you have no license at all, 
if you're convicted of a DUI as a minor, um, you will lose your privilege to drive for either one year or when you turn 18. Um, so it's not, it doesn't really matter whether or not he had a driver's permit, a driver's license, or none at all. He would still get the same time period of the uh, suspension of the driving privilege. Now you said one year or turn 18, so if someone, somebody's 17 and a half, does it go a full year, or does it just go till they turn 18? If they're <coughs> 17 and a half, uh, and uh, I haven't had one of these cases in a while, but my, if recollection serves me, if you get it when you're 17 and a half, you're going to still get it for a year. But if you're like 16, the, the suspension may last until you're 18. Oh, I see. So it can be longer, not shorter. Correct. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, you're great. Thanks. You or me? Uh, you, of course. Oh, I just want to know. I just want to know. <laughs> <coughs> now, have you gotten very many felonies reduced to misdemeanors? Uh, yes, we have. We have um, uh, myself and Jim Bates works with our firm. We handle, you know, 80%, 90% of the felonies. Um, we will always try to get uh, uh, the felonies <coughs> reduced to misdemeanors <coughs> before a plea. Now, now what I've done is, um, I you can tell them what a wobbler is. I've had a felony that was a wobbler and made the agreement that if they met their probation, that we could come back in and have it retroactively reduced to a, a misdemeanor. Well, it depends on the terminology. Uh, anytime you're convicted of a felony, you're always entitled to come back in the Antelope Valley uh, and most other courts. The judges want to wait at least half of the probationary period. So here, if you're convicted of a felony, you're placed on five years probation. So after two and a half years to five years, you can come in and ask for the, the, the probation to be terminated. Once you do that, you can also ask for the, the case if it's a wobbler. And by a wobbler, that simply means that certain charges can either be charged as um, a misdemeanor or a felony, <laughs> like uh, possession <coughs> of methamphetamine or petty theft with a prior, um, things of that nature, grand theft, um, receiving stolen property. All those charges can either be misdemeanors or felonies. Um, and then you can get it reduced to a misdemeanor. Um, but again, that doesn't really mean what some people would like it to mean. You're still a convicted felon. So you still can, can you can you vote, or or you're that's also excluded. And these are the you know, I don't know. I've never had anybody come to me with that. I just know the things that matter to me because I'm a criminal specialist is when someone who got something reduced thought they could go ahead and have a gun. That's really the one of the main things that we get. Uh, and they have a gun in their possession in their house for self-defense. And somehow law enforcement catches wind of it, and then they're charged with felon in possession of a gun, even, e though, even though it's they got it reduced back. to a misdemeanor. <coughs> that doesn't seem quite fair. The only way that's going to work, because I did a case down in uh, Inglewood, actually, where the gentleman was charged with a felony uh, possession for sale of, of, of drugs. I was able to get the plea this way, and this is the only way you can get it done, is if, you, if, the, if the DA's office isn't going to reduce immediately, you can say, well, I'll take that deal if at the end of, let's say, a year or a year and a half, that plea is the legal term, I don't want to bore everybody, not everybody in this room, is nunk pro tunk. If you can get the plea uh, turned back nunk pro tunk, and that basically means there was a mistake from the beginning. So I've had, and in that case, what happened was the kid waited a year, a year and a half, I think it was, and didn't get in any other trouble. And then the plea that was taken a year and a half ago was taken back as if it never was was was, was put in the file. And therefore, and then we got it back as a misdemeanor. And so, uh, if you do it right, if you know how to plea bargain to those kind of in those kind of situations, then like that person, he's not a convicted felon. But if you just do a normal 1203.4 motion to expunge down to a misdemeanor, that's like, you know, who cares? I mean, I don't think it does that much. I usually talk about a sunset clause, but I like your nun pro I, I've done a few of those in family law when the person actually got married twice and didn't realize they were still married, and I had to correct as if it was a mistake. But I haven't done them in criminal law, and that's quite interesting. Right. So you tell them ahead of time, you put it on the record sure. that if they've completed the probation appropriately, they can come back in and if they've been a good Joe, all of a sudden it can be a non pro tunct plea retroactively as if it was a mistake, have been a misdemeanor. Correct. And and but of course you have <coughs> to get, you know, the DA's <laughs> office or the city attorney's get office. Everybody was, lined up. Everybody's gotta be on the same page and it's you know but in that case we were able to do that and, and that gentleman he in fact he just called me, he's going to law school now. Excellent. Um, and so he would never, you know, he would have a major problem with a as a convicted felon sure. for drugs, sales well, of just drugs. Just because you pass the bar doesn't mean they're going to let you be an attorney. Right. So I'm just saying, so it helped that fu the future of that kid. So that's why we work so hard because, you know, people come to us and they're only looking at the short term. We have to look at not only the short term, but the long term for the rest of their life. We have another call. Attorney Steve Fox and Attorney David Wallen, can we help you? Hi, I was just watching the program. I just wanted to find out if there's going to be any changes in the uh, three-strike law or even two-strikes. 
if there's going to be any reducement or, you know, uh, well, like if you're good for the pet next 10 years, if it can be reduced or taken away or something. Okay, well, I haven't heard any, any uh, word that they're going to try to uh, change the law to put what's called a, let's say, a burnout period or a washout period. Like in some kind of crimes, uh, if it's over 10 years, uh, like if you want something like diversion, if something's over 10 years old, maybe you can still get diversion. But in three strikes, there is no burnout period. And I don't know of any law that uh, anybody's proposing to change that. The, the only difference is now with Steve Cooley as the DA of LA County, he has uh, publicly said uh, that the policy is changing for the DA's office and that if the third strike is not a serious violent felony, he is not going to uh, use the three strikes law in that case and he will strike one of the, the strikes uh, and so there will only be a second strike and he won't be looking or she won't be looking at 25 years to life but something substantially less than that. Well, thank you very much. You're welcome. Have a good evening. Now, David, you mentioned a diversions program. Why don't you explain to them on how that affects the plea and, and what it results in? Well, uh, there's a, what's called in the system the deferred entry of judgment. And what happens is, let's say you're um, arrested for possession <laughs> of, let's say, methamphetamine or cocaine, and you have no prior <laughs> record. Uh, you can't do it for sales. But if you've got a straight possession case, what can happen is, uh, if you qualify, uh, you can uh, plead to the charge but never be sentenced. And then you go on in like an 18 month program where you do classes and testing and things of that nature. And after 18 months, if you've been a good Joe, as, as Steve said, uh, or Josephina, then um, the case will be dismissed as if you never pled. And then it'll go down as a dismissal uh, and you will not be a convicted felon. Of course, on the other hand, if you blow probation, instead of it retroactively happening as though it never did, they can haul you in and make you fulfill the full sentence in jail. Right, but generally what happens is on a, on a possession, they'll tell you, <laughs> if you blow it, you're going to do 180 days. And so you know that that's the hammer hanging over your head. And, um, and now, starting I think in July, they're starting the drug court system, which is uh, a little different, but same, same vein, where for straight possession cases, um, they're looking more at, at uh, drug rehab and schooling versus custody time. So, you know, those are some things that, that uh, are going to be tried. Can you, you know, there's many kinds of pleas. There's guilty, not guilty, no contest, or no contendere, we call it, or no contest under Peoples versus West. Uh, for the diversions program, can you plead the no contest under Peoples versus West, or it has to be a, a guilty plea? And let me state what I think that means. The no contest under Peoples versus West is a case where innocent people, because of a factual basis, have determined to take a penalty. And the result is then there's no civil ramifications. But going back to my question on the divergence, do you have to plead guilty on that? The, the judges that I've seen want you to say the word guilty, even though in reality it really doesn't matter. But, um, you know, people will, will say people versus West because they will take the benefit of the deal. Let's say we get someone who was charged with a felony, we get it down to a misdemeanor in no time, and they want to take that because they don't want to look at the possible exposure of possible jail if they lost a trial. So they'll say, listen, I didn't do this, but I want to take this great deal. So we'll plead no contest pursuant to People versus West, which tells the court, I'm not saying I'm guilty. I just want to take the benefit of this good deal. Uh, and then people will say no contest because of the civil ramifications. If it's a misdemeanor um, and you plead no contest, then they can't use that against you uh, if somebody tries to sue you, let's say for vandalism or for uh, you know some kind of damage to a car or some person. Um, but on a felony, you can plead no contest all day, and it doesn't uh, it doesn't uh, matter. Although, it's only for a misdemeanor. Well, you know, I actually, I read the case on the People's versus West, and it actually, uh, the felony was more to the judge's option to use that. We have another call, Attorney Steve Fox and Attorney David Wallen. Can we help you? Um, this question is for Steve Fox. Um, what are your rights when you're getting pulled over for like you have? narcotics in your car, like when they ask if they can search <coughs> your car, can you say no? Well, you, you do have the right to say no. The problem is, is they can still arrest you for other reasons that they feel they have probable cause. They can then take your car in and they can also do an inventory search of your car. David, do you want to add anything to that? Well, the basic law stems back to, gosh, lots of years from Terry versus Ohio, where basically the police have to have what's called articulable facts. They have to have facts that they can state that say that there's some criminal activity going on. 
before they can, let's say, search your car. Um, they can search you if they think that you have a weapon for their safety. What if you're just like some teenager and um, you have a bunch of other teenagers in the car and you guys are playing loud music and they just decide because you're young, they want to pull you over and search your car. And well, again, you're, you're prefacing the statement, but all I can tell you is generally they have to have probable cause, is the legal term, to pull you over. That probable cause means they have to see that some criminal activity is afoot, something that they think is so suspicious that they have the right to pull you over. And then ultimately, if the person is arrested and, and charged with something, then that person, if they go to an attorney, that the attorney will try to see if there's a legal basis to get that charge dismissed by getting the evidence thrown out because, in, fa in fact, it was an illegal stop or an illegal search. Well, um, I live in East Palmdale, and the majority of the cops out here find just being a teenager and having, like, other kids in your car or having a nice car is probably a cause enough to search you, even if you don't have anything on you. Well, again, I can't. I can't really speak to that specific uh, issue that you're addressing. I can only tell you that that um, you know, law enforcement, if they're going to pull you over, they're going to pull you over. Uh, if they're going to be honest and write write it down the way it really happened on the police report, uh, and it turns out to be something that is a violative of the Constitution, and really there was no a legal probable cause, then hopefully we can get that dismissed and the and you know the charges missed and the case dropped. But if an officer pulls you over for just because he has a hunch, and then in the police report writes down something that really isn't true, then you go back to it's a credibility issue, and who is the judge going to believe? Somebody who was caught with methamphetamine or an officer? And that those are tough. Those are tough cases. Do they look at the officer's background, like, or do well, they just look at the person against his background? Well, in terms of looking at an officer's background, those kind of things. Uh, will occur if you have a legal right to do that uh, and something you're touching on is, is if you're charged let's say with assaulting an officer or you know disobeying an officer that's you know doing something in his lawful duties if you want to get the record on that officer to see if that officer has a, a record of people complaining about him uh, for prior abuse prior lying you can do that in what it's legally called a pitches motion and you have to file that and try to get the officer's background and then you have to interview all those past people. And then you'll forgive me, we have about two minutes left and two calls left. We'll take one more. Attorney C. Fox and Attorney David Wallen. Yes, hi. Uh, I was listening to you guys talk about uh, possible early termination of probation or getting your felony reduced to a misdemeanor. Right. And uh, I've been on probation now going on a little over three and a half years. Felony probation? Yes. Okay. And, uh, and I had asked my probation officer, is there any way that I can get out probation? Because I've had a job, you know, since the day I got on probation, I've been doing right. I haven't got in not one lick of trouble. Right. And, uh, you know, I was interested in trying to find out a way of going about possibly getting my felony reduced to a misdemeanor or early termination of probation. Well, the way you do that is you either can go in by yourself or, or ask your public defender to do it or hire an attorney to go in, get your case pulled, and, and request of the judge to terminate probation because ultimately it's not up to the probation officer it's up to the judge okay and with that we'd like to thank everybody i especially like to thank david for being on our show tonight oh, no problem, no problem. david you were actually the best i've seen oh, okay. and, and you've, you you've attracted the most public so i want to thank you you're welcome uh, and again uh we have uh, a show next week we'll have claudia weaver on attorney at law to talk about divorce and family law and you'll be able to call in next week uh, at 726-0382 for you in the law, where you have an opportunity to hear two attorneys discuss the law, and you'll have an opportunity to give a phone call, call in, uh, and ask two attorneys, and, and not be charged for the advice. So again, welcome to the Steve Fox Show, and we'll see you again next week. Thanks.